little trick with conversions. Yes. I was trying to watch YouTube videos. <laughs> right. All you're going to do with conversions, you do two steps and you'll never get it wrong. You okay. multiply by one and you make sure everything cancels top and bottom that are the same. In other yes. words, if let's convert, say you want to convert 12 inches or let's say 12, yeah, make it easy, 12 inches. You want to convert that into say kilometers. Okay. You always write down what you're starting with. So you're starting with 12 inches and you put a time sum. So far so good? Yeah. You know, inches have to go on the bottom, just like you said. And we can convert inches into, let's see, there's 2.54 centimeters in the name. So one inch is 2.54 centimeters. That's when you conversion it from a conversion table. Okay. So this unit here, is equal to one. 2.54 yes. centimeters is the exact same thing as one inch. One inch, yes. So as long as these things equal one and these units are gonna cancel, inches cancel. Then you go with centimeters on the bottom. Centimeter centi, the letter C, if you look on the metric table, is yes. 10 to the negative two meters. That's what C equals. So again, this equals one. Instead yeah. of writing C, you write 10 to negative two. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. That's okay. what it's a science, the scientific notation. Right. Um, and then meters on the bottom, kilometers on top. Make that equal to one. K is 10 to the third. And you've gone from inches to kilometers. You just take 10, 12 times 2.54 times 10 to negative two divided by 10 to the third. And just take Easy way to do the math is 12 times 2.54 is 20, what, 25 point something? Let me do the math real quick. Pull up a calculator here. Calculator and 12 times 2.54 equals 30.48. I had three, uh, it's only two so many digits, so 30. So I got um, three point. Zero five. Oh, yes, yeah, so it's actually 30.48. It depends on your significant digits. We haven't done that in this point. Yet. And then it's times 10 to the negative two times 10 to the negative three. Could you bring that up? When you bring this up, you change the sign. So it's 30.48 times 10 to the negative five, which comes out to three. Well, three's in a digit, it's 3.05. Yes. Okay. Times 10 to the negative five. And I move that one one place to the left. Oh, it's one. That small make that bigger. So I'm 10 to the minus four kilometers. And that'd be the answer. If it was three significant digits. It was like 12.0 inches you started it. Okay. But those two tricks, always multiply by one. Okay. And make sure your units cancel. Centimeters cancel, meters cancel, and you're left with kilometers. Let me see what else did I have a question. Will we be able to use a calculator for the test? Yep. Okay. Is it open book or no? It's open book, open notes. Yep. Yes. Are the tests timed? Was that? Are the tests timed? Yes. Three hours. That's the one where I have them controlling it. In other words, a lot of people will not finish the test, and that's okay. The tests are going to be long, so it's going to test your knowledge of what you know. Because I'm not testing that you can look up every answer. You're not going to have time to do that. So you have to know the stuff. If you know the stuff, you got the calculator, you got your notes, you know where to look, and you study, you'll do fine. But there are going to be long tests. I can't, I can't control, you know, at-home tests. Okay? But they will be long, and you'll, as long as you know your stuff, you'll be able to do just fine on them. Okay. Okay. So Bilal, is it, is it Bilal had a question? Raise your hand. Is that you see your yeah. name? Bilal. The, say it again. Bilal. Bilal? Yes, doctor. Okay. I'll probably mess that up again. Just remind me. It's all good. It's no problem. Um, I'm just okay. wondering if I rented a book from Amazon, how do I get access to Sapling? Because I don't have any textbook or homework material right now. Right, the sapling is, you have to go to sapling. Um, 
It's saplinglearning.com and sign up for sapling. When you sign up for sapling, they give you the book for free, the ebook. Oh. Okay. The, the sapling, sapling is all your homework and all your labs. So it's saplinglearning.com. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I too had a question about the book. I'm sorry. Okay, what's that? If you go to Sapling Learning, that when you purchase Sapling, you purchase through the bookstore if you want. And I've got the code in the syllabus if you want to purchase it elsewhere. But when you purchase Sapling, you get the textbook for free. It's an ebook, e text. The sampling is all your homework and all your labs are through sampling. That was the cheapest way to go for everybody too. And we don't have to have a special lab or anything like that. Okay, I had a question. Sure. Uh, Cause when it says on your recommended text on your um, canvas, it says to get the, this one, right? Cause I got this one, but I thought that I would get a book with it or is it just the access code? It's the access code, but that gives you access to the e-text. Okay, so this gives me access to e-text. Right, the sapling should give you your homework, your labs, and your e-textbook. Okay, I just want to make sure it was the right one. Yep. That should be should be just perfect. So once we log on to there, it should just show everything. Is it kind of like WebAssign where we log on and then it has all the assignments listed and then we just turn it in? Yep, you just do all the assignments, complete them at your own pace. Yep. Okay. And then that can, all those assignments get converted to your Canvas account automatically. And then I can see exactly what your scores are. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. But yeah, we'll follow the, the textbook is we'll go right along with it with everything else. It's it's, it's geared to go all, all as one unit. So that way you got you got your homework, you got your lab, you got your textbook all in one. Yeah, I was just trying to make sure that because um, when I ordered it, it made it seem like it, it would come with a book, like a literal book. And then this was probably just an access code that came along with it. So I just want to make sure that I didn't yeah, waste yeah. my money. But no, no, the ebook comes with it. Okay. okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Hey, good. No problem. Other questions? Oh, yeah, so, I have another question. I'm sorry. Sure, you go ahead. Um, I noticed in the modules um, that the due dates have different dates. Like, for example, the majority of the due dates say July 29th and then July 9th. Do we have to adhere to those or is it just? Well, July 29th, last, July 29th is the last day of class. So everything's due by then. All the homework, okay. all the labs are due by July 29th. The only thing that has okay. different due dates will be the midterm. And then the final, I think, is on the 29th also. Okay. The midterm, the midterm is going to be given. I think it's July 9th was the midterm you're referring to. Okay, it makes sense. Those are the only two different, only two times you have to be online at that time. The midterm is going to be on July 9th and it's going to open at 12.01 a.m. and close at 11.59 p.m. on July 9th. And there's a, I think it's a three hour block. You have to take the midterm. I'll give you three hours or two and a half, whatever is written on there. Okay. And you just do that one block and you have 24 hours to do it in. So and sometimes, because I know people work, people have jobs during the summer, things like that. So you got a 24 hour block to take that midterm during that day. Okay. okay. So, so just to confirm, we only have one midterm and one final. One midterm, one final. Okay. And then the rest are just quizzes because I read through your. The, re the rest your... are your homework and your, okay. uh, your labs. Okay. The homework is worth 20 points each. And there's 16 of them. The labs are worth. 15 points and there's 16 of those. Okay. So Dodger, you said I need some access code for saplinglearning.com. Is that correct? Correct. You need the access code to get onto sapling. And once you're on there, you'll have you'll have your homework, you'll have your labs, and you'll have your um your textbook, e-text. Um, I'm sorry, where can I find the code? You said it's on the canvas. Yeah, you have to go to SAP. The, you have the code in my in my syllabus. Let me pull the syllabus up here real quick. Let's do this actually. And let's screen share uh, desktop. 
Okay, and if I go to, everybody see Cobb everybody see the Cobb Mountain College uh, website? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. You go to Perl, go to, let's just pull this class up. And this, oh, how could it be interrupted? There it goes. And you just go to a class and let's pull the syllabus up. Okay, so here's the syllabus and you're learning exactly this. And right here, here's your textbook. This is the ISBN number. You can get this through the um, uh, bookstore on base, on bookstore on base, bookstore on campus. And we want to go to get it. This is the ISBN number of the, of the, of the course. And this gives you the sapling of your homework, your labs, and then your e textbook. Okay, so this includes the sapling plus that you need. And it'll give you the access code to get down to everything. And like I said, yeah, you have all your chapters set up of a good time frame. You can work ahead of the schedule, behind the schedule, whatever. But the only two only thing that are necessary are on July 9th and July 29th. July 9th is the midterm. I guess you'd be a 24 hour span to take that into sign in. And the final exam, which is cumulative, which means it's gonna cover the whole semester on July 29th. And I gave the, there's a practice in sapling on how to use it. That gives you an extra five points if you wanna do that. Then the, the homework is worth 20 points. The online labs are worth 15 points. There's 16 of each of those. One midterm, 150, and one final, 250 points. That's how the class is broken down. And I think that was pretty much it for that. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, thank you. That makes sense, Vilan? Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Any Anytime you questions, let me know. Because I know it's a lot of information. This class is a really, really fast paced class during the for summertime. Let's go back to our home. And if you if you want to ever, if if you're going to miss some of these discussions, if you want, you can always make them up. If you go to the home page here and you go down to videos, if you click on videos, it's going to list, I'm going to put all the recorded videos right here of all the meetings, all, all the discussion, you want to read, go back and review something. This is the introductory one for the class I sent out to, to look at, shows you to do things. And they'll all be posted right there, like I said, under, under videos. And this, this is Pumpernickel. This is my, he's a giant schnauzer. He helps me. He's my buddy. He, he's usually out here somewhere when I'm talking, but I don't see him right now. But he's always around. All right, let's go back to, any more questions on the syllabus or, or the module? We'll go through the modules. And the modules are just pretty straightforward. They introduce everything to the class and then their practice assignment is here. Chapter one, homework one. Chapter two, homework two. Chapter three, excuse me, homework three, lab one. Then there's your lab one and sapling. Lab two, lab two and sapling. Lab three tells you what it is, lab three and sapling. And then these other things here, these are extra. These are like significant figures. You've got trouble with significant figures? This is my way of explaining it. I mean, we'll pull it up. And here's a list of the different rules of significant figures. And it'll help you to understand each one of those. Okay, if you want to go to the next, you, know, you navigate it either way in modules, you can help with conversions. Here's how we do conversions. Okay, and you can also, like uh, Diane, Diana was saying, if you go to YouTube, there's fantastic videos out there for YouTube. Um, Kaplan, Kaplan Learning makes some really great videos for chemistry. Okay, those are really good to watch too. And if, if you want extra help, you can log on with me and I can give you extra help, or I can refer you to different videos on YouTube also. Because all my classes were organic chemistry, I teach anatomy, physiology, all those classes went on YouTube and online. So those are the modules and that's about all you need to know for that class. Okay, so each one of those weeks will give you that example. Like week two, week two is chapter four and five, the homework, lab four and five, and then energy and light, electron configurations, ionic compounds, covalent compounds, naming things. That'll give you some extra help if you want it. Okay. All right. So any other questions? Go back to my iPad here. 
Yeah, I do. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. No problem. That's what we're here for. Yeah, I was I was looking over the syllabus and I was trying to find the class code you mentioned for the sapling and I don't see it. Oh, it's under the textbook. It's the ISBN number. Is that what you mean? Oh, no, I thought you meant like we have like a certain class code because once we um, log into the sap to the sapling with our own personal access code, I thought that we might have like an additional class code so it knows which class. No, just, my, just, just my class and the right to it. Uh, I'm okay. entering the ISBN number into the sapling website, but it doesn't give me any book. No, the, the ISBN number is what you have to buy, purchase it through. Like you use that number to purchase the sapling code. Okay, because I'm in sapling website now. I'm not sure. Right. How I can find the book though. So. Yeah, you have to go in as a student and say you want to register for sapling and, and you want to put on the Revell code. Or it might be easiest just to go to the bookstore and get the, the just tell them about the ice cream. They have all that right there for you. And they'll give you everything that you need. Doctor, if yeah. you go to the upper right where it says, uh, what is it, Macmillan Learning? Uh, mm -hmm. higher learning you click on that and it logs you on to sapley and i think you can purchase it from there i think that's where i got it okay so uh, when you're logging in the canvas course like dana was saying on, on the, the upper link, left was that on the upper left it says mcmillan higher education there'll be one of your links like the module links and grades stuff like that one of the links will say mcmillan higher education yes click on that and that will take you to the sapling course Did that make sense, Milan? Yes, Dr. I'm on it. Okay, that should get you to the sampling course. You can purchase it right that way directly. Yeah, I actually, I actually see it right now. Do when we're logging in, do we use our personal email address or our student email? Uh, it doesn't or doesn't matter. matter. It doesn't matter. Whichever one you want to go to. Okay. Because it, it's it's all that's tied into me to my to my my canvas. So I'll okay, get all got it. Either way. Okay, perfect. Cool. Yeah, once you get it, it should be pretty straightforward to go through things. Right. Other questions? I, mean, I can I can just kind of go through the chapters with you because I'm not, I'm not going to, I mean, to lecture on everything, but you, there's just too much stuff to go over. So you go at your own pace and make sure to make sure to read the chapters beforehand. You can ask me questions as we go along. Chapter one is basically basic introductions to stuff. Um, I can go through it here, point out highlights is like um, we're talking about different types of matter. There's solids, liquids, and gases. Are your three types of matter? You should be able to identify for your for the midterm the difference between a pure substance and mixtures. Mixtures are two or more components mixed together, and there's two types of mixtures: heterogeneous and homogeneous. Heterogeneous mixture means it's separated or different areas. In other words, if you have two beakers, and I'm not a great artist, so you have to bear with me with water here. Okay. My son's the artist in the family. He works for it. You ever hear of Nitro Circus? Nobody's heard of Nitro Circus? So it's a Daredevil motorcycle group that performs all over the, the world. He's a graphic designer for them. He just got a job with... Uh, Primitive skateboards, that ring bell with anybody? He does all the graphic design for them. He's a fantastic artist. He does a lot of the graphics work. But a homogeneous solution or a heterogeneous solution? A homogeneous solution is like salt water. There's salt suspended in water all through there or oil in water. This is H2O. This is oil, okay? 
So this is homogeneous, which means no matter where you take a sample, okay, if you took a sample here, sample here, or a sample here, it's going to be exactly the same. In a heterogeneous, if I took a sample here, a sample here, or a sample here, they'd all be different. Okay, so wherever you take a sample from, if it's going to be the same, no matter where you take it, that's a homogeneous solution throughout. Heterogeneous means it's different throughout. So that's your type of solutions. Um, your pure substances are either going to be elements or compounds. Okay. So those are going to be pure elements, what's on the periodic table. Okay. Compounds are when elements are combined, like H2, like water. Okay. Your mixtures are homogeneous and heterogeneous. So let's go through the book here, physical. Uh, you need to know physical and chemical changes and physical and chemical properties. Okay. Physical change is usually something that can be reversed. Okay. Chemical change means you've altered the chemical structure of something. Okay. If an ice cube melts into water, that's a physical change. It's still H2O, right? Okay, whether it's a solid, whether it's a liquid, or whether it's steam, whether it's a gas, it's still H2O. It has not changed its chemical structure. So it's just a physical change. Okay, chemical change. Let's say we take hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas and put an electrical spark to it and form water. Okay, that's a chemical change. You've changed hydrogen and oxygen into H2O. Okay, so that's a chemical change. Uh, other examples would be like firewood. Chopping firewood is a physical change. You cut it into smaller pieces. Burning firewood is a chemical change. Okay, you change it into carbon dioxide and water as you burn the wood. Okay, reacts with oxygen and produces byproducts. Okay, so that's a physical change. Gasoline evaporating is a physical change. It's still octane, whatever it compounds from gasoline. You take gasoline, you put it in your motorcycle engine, run it through there. That's a chemical change. You're producing carbon monoxide and water. That's the difference between physical and chemical changes. If you have questions, let me know. Uh, energy and change, all that looks good. Scientific method you read about. That's basically important stuff for chapter one. Okay. So any, any questions on chapter one so far? Like I said, you guys read through this before the class, before my uh, talk, so you can ask me any questions you like, and I'm here to answer anything. Um, chapter two, we're starting to deal with measurements. Uh, scientific notation. Scientific notation is just the number for scientific notation, your number has to be greater than greater than or equal to one and less than 10. That's the main number. It has to be greater than equal to, and then, and then exponents can determine where the decimal point goes. So you always express scientific notation. It's gonna be like 1.78 times 10 to the negative three. So this number here is always going to be greater than or equal to one and less than 10. So 8.396 times 10 to the 2 is scientific notation. Okay. Would this be scientific notation? 83.78 times 10 to the negative 3. Is that number in scientific notation? Anybody want to guess? Yes, it is. No, nope, it's not. No? <laughs> this number here has oh, to be. Yes, 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 yes. It has to be. Okay. Has okay. to be between 1 and 10. 1 and 10, correct. So if you wrote it as 8.378 times 10 to the, I made this, I'll make this smaller, make this bigger, negative 2. That's the same number as above. These are equal. 
but this number here is in scientific notation. So on the exam, if they ask for scientific notation, it has to be expressed as a number between one and 10, grade, greater than or equal to one and less than 10. And then the right number was called significant digits here. And then multiply by the proper exponent to give you the right value. Okay, so that is scientific notation. Uh, oops, I skipped some. Just kind of looking through the chapters here as we go through, make sure we hit on some of the highlights here that you guys might need to know. Uh, it gives you some conversion numbers like one meter is 3.28 feet, one inch is 2.54 centimeters. Uh, what else do there? Uh, there's 5,200 feet in a mile. You know, little things like that to help you convert different units. And like I said, they'll all be listed for you. There, I have a data packet. Everybody familiar with that? Yes. Okay, you all have a data packet in your syllabus, on your uh, modules there. Just click on that. That gives you all the conversions you need for the class. So it's all in one handy spot for you. You can use that throughout the class. It'll really help a lot. And then you need to know the base, like milli, millimeter is milli means 10 to minus three. Uh, megameter, mega is 10 to the six. Deci is 10 to minus two. Micro is 10 to minus six. All those units have different val values in the metric system. And again, that's all in the data. You don't have to memorize any of that. Just know how to use them in calculations. Uh, know the difference between accuracy and precision. this cleared off here so we can do a little bit more. Okay, for those that are archers or shooters, if you have a target or dart players, okay. if your shots are all gathered right there, you have five shots, five of the bullseye. That is high accuracy. It's very accurate and high precision. They're all grouped together. Okay. If you have a group, you have a target here, and all your shots are right here. Okay. Five shots all go right there. That is low accuracy. Okay. But it's high precision. I hit the thing. I'm probably spelling that wrong. P R E. Precision. Change that. Okay, so a high, it's low accuracy because it's not hitting the bullseye, but they're all repeatable together the same. So high precision. If your target looks like this, like when I go shooting with my daughter, no, I'm just kidding. She's a real good shot, actually. She outshoots me with, the, with uh, pistols. Okay, that's low accuracy because there's nothing by the bullseye and it's low precision because they're not grouped together. So accuracy is how close you get to the bullseye, your, your, your measured mark. Precision is how well that remark gets repeated over and over, doing it again. Okay, so that is accuracy and precision. When, you measure, when you're measure when you measuring something in a lab, one of the labs will have you measuring things in a beaker or a graduated cylinder. In the graduated cylinder, you read the marking by what's called the lower part of the meniscus. So if you have a graduated cylinder here, and this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And we fill this with liquid here. Let's fill this with liquid. And the liquid goes like this. Okay, there's your liquid. Like I said, I'm not a great artist. But this is 10 nine, eight, seven, six, five, okay? When you read that, that is eight milliliters. That's marked off in milliliters, okay? You look at the bottom part of the water because the water will have a concave surface, okay? It'll tend to go up the sides because water is polar. It'll group together and tend to move up the sides. You do not measure at the high point of the water. You look at the, the bowl, the bowl basically forms at the bottom of that bowl. It's called the meniscus. That's what you measure. 
that is your measurement at the bottom of the meniscus. And there'll be a couple labs that you do where you have to do your measurement. That's what you're measuring that. Okay. Same with the thermometer. Okay, significant digits. You cannot make a number more significant okay, than what you measure value. In other words, if you're using the art set to measure your son's or your daughter's height, you can say they're four foot three, maybe a half an inch. You can't say they're four foot 3.78927 inches. You can't make a number more accurate than it is. Okay? All you can do is what your measurement is. Okay? That's your significant digits. And there's rules for using significant digits because you cannot manipulate a number through statistics or math and make it more significant. Okay? You can't create a value and make it with more degree of certainty than it's already there. So there's different rules for multiplying, different rules for adding and subtracting. So multiplying, dividing have one set of rules, adding, subtracting have another set of rules. Okay. So for multiplication and division, okay, you take the number with the least amount of significant figures and that's your answer. Now you have to do a couple of these on the midterm too. So say I have the 3.83 times 9.2, okay? Now, this number has three significant digits. This number has two significant digits. So your answer can only have two significant digits. Because when you multiply or you divide, you can only have that number as accurate as one with the least number of significant digits. And if the number is exact, you use the one number with the significant digits. Correct. correct? Okay. If you give, if say you're doing, say you're going to have every student in the classroom 1.78 ounces of sulfur in the experiment, and there's 24 students. So how much do you need? So 1.78 times 24. This number, I know it's two zero digits, but it's an exact number. You can't cut students in half. You know, some people would like to. <laughs> You can't have 24.5 students or 24.2 students. You have 24.0000 as long as you need it. That's an exact number, like Dan was saying. If you have an exact number, that does not count in as significant figures. So your answer would have three significant digits, okay? If it's an exact number. A significant digit is applied to measurements. Okay, those are measured values. If it's not a measured value, it's, it's good to whatever it is. Like uh, 3.28 feet in a meter. There's exactly 3.28 feet in a meter. That doesn't count for your significant digits. Your conversion numbers are all considered exact. They're not measured values. There's four rules to it, yeah. Four rules to what? For the significant, to figure out the significant digits. Right, if you have, uh, it's, a lot of it has problems with uh, like leading zeros. If you have the number, uh, 0 0.0078. How many significant digits do you have? You have two. Okay. Leading zeros. These leading zeros here are not significant. Okay. They're placeholders. If I had the number 0 0.00780, this has three significant digits. Now that zero is significant. The easiest way to look at that is to say that this is not changing the value of the number. We're adding this. Can you take, you cannot take these zeros away. If you took those away, they're gonna be completely different. They're placeholders. If I took this zero away, the number would be the same, 0 0.0078. It'd be the same. So the only reason that zero is there is because we know we measured it to that amount. So zeros after the decimal point, after an integer, like a number value are significant because otherwise it wouldn't be there. And zeros between integers are significant. Like if I had seven zero zero eight four three, how many significant digits are that? Six. Six. Perfect. You got it. That's six. So those zeros are significant. So the only real problem comes with zeros. If they're before the number, they're placeholders. They're not significant. If they're after a digit, 
after the decimal, then they're significant. Okay? And if they're between integers, they're significant. Okay? If they're after the digits, but there's no decimal, they're not significant. That's the last rule. So if you have six, nine, three, zero, zero, okay? That has three significant digits. These zeros are placeholders, just like they were before. Those are not significant. You need them there to make that number because you can't round that off to 693. That's 69,300. Okay. If you ever have a question, put it in scientific notation. Okay. That'll make it very simple for you. Okay. Now, if there's a decimal point here, if I have six, what happened? There it goes. If I had six, nine, three, point, zero, zero, now those zeros are significant. So leading zeros and trailing zeros are not significant unless there's a decimal point. If there's a decimal point, then trailing zeros are significant as long as they come after an integer. Because these, I realize these zeros are after a decimal point, but there's no integers before them, so they're not significant. Okay, that's how we did determine significant figures. Let me, let me do a couple examples here. I'll help you guys out. Let's see. Uh, let's go to the next. I got, I got a couple pages on this thing. Here we go. Let's do. So I'm going to give you some numbers. You tell me. How many significant digits? Four. Four, perfect, you got it. How many significant digits? Three. No? no. Five. Five, you got it, perfect. These zeros are significant. Zeros after a decimal point are significant. The only, way, the only reason we're including those is we know they're accurate to that amount because it wouldn't change the numbers. They weren't there. How many significant digits? One. One. Perfect. Okay. There, there's, there's no integer before those. Those are leading zeros. They're just placeholders. There's only one significant digit. All right. Let's do... How many significant digits? Five. Five. You guys are catching on. How many significant digits? There's no five. Five. Four. Four. Okay, remember trailing zeros, if there's no decimal point, are placeholders. They're not significant. That has four significant digits. And I wouldn't try to trick you on an exam either. <laughs> You'll see examples just like that. Okay. Do one more, then we'll move on to the, the rules. Uh, let's make up another number. Seven. Point zero, 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 three, zero. How many significant digits? Five. Almost. Six. Six. Zeros after the decimal point, after this integer, are significant. Okay, so once you're after the decimal point and you got more values here, any zero after a decimal point becomes significant. Okay, then went through all the examples. All right, so. Just a question, Dr. How sure, go ahead. 0 0.0009 okay. has one significant number. 0 0.0009, okay, is one significant digits. Leading zeros are not significant. That is written in scientific notation is nine times 10 to the negative. Let's see, we're at one, two, three, four, 10 to the four. And there's your one significant digit. That's your right scientific notation. Scientific notation reflects your significant digits. 
Okay, so zeros in front of the number, in front of the first digit center are only placeholders to determine the value where the decimal point is. They're not significant in a measurement. Does that make sense, Blonde? Yes, Doc. Okay, perfect, no problem. Like I said, I, I love questions. Questions means you're listening to me. All right, so that we, we, we said there's two different types of rules. There's rules for multiplication and division, rules for adding and subtracting. Rules for multiplication and division is the answer can only have this amount of city days with the least number being used. So if I took like say 3.07 times 4.298. Okay, if you do it on the calculator, it comes out to, let's see, 3.07 times 4.298, 4.298. Comes out to, one three point one nine four eight six. Okay, that's what it says on your calculator, right? If you put that number on the exam, you will get it wrong. You have made that number more accurate than it was measured. You can't do that. You can't make a number more accurate by using mathematical manipulation. It's against all the rules of statistics. You, just, you can't do that. You can't manipulate numbers to make them as accurate as you want. They're limited to how you measured your data. Okay, so this one, how many significant digits does this number have? Three point oh seven. Three, perfect. How many number, How many significant digits here? Four. Four. So your answer can only have the least number in multiplying and dividing. So we can only have three digits. So that's you're gonna have to draw a line. Now, now you got to round it off. Okay. If this number is greater than five, this number rounds up. If that number is less than five, that number stays the same. Okay. So this is nine, so it's greater. So this becomes 13.2. That's your answer. If it's exactly five, it rounds up also. So if it's five or greater, it goes up. If it's less than five, it stays the same. Okay. So that would be your answer. Look at, let's do a division problem. Let's take six. 0.32 divided by 19.7937. So you do that on the calculator, you will get, uh, where's my calculator? Lost it again. 6.32 divided by 19 point, oops, I hit, I hit something wrong. 6.32 divided by 19.7937, equals 0 0.3129351. Okay, is that what your calculator says? Every single to follow along, get the same numbers I'm getting. If you don't, let me know, because either I'm wrong or you're wrong. Okay, now, if you put that answer, will you get it right on the exam? No. No. How many significant digits does this number have? Three. Three. How many does this number have? Six. Six. Which is a smaller number? Three. Okay. So this number can only have three significant digits. Is this zero significant? No. No. It's a placeholder. Leading zeros are not significant until they come after a number or after a decimal point, okay? So we're gonna have three, there's one, two, three. So you draw your line right here. So this number here is less than five. So that number here stays the same. So it's 0 0.319 is your answer.
Making sense? Yes. All right. Let's move on to adding and subtracting. So now everybody's an expert at multiplying and dividing, right? And I guarantee you'll see some of those on your, your midterm exam. You'll see some that say, give the answer to this, and you need to put in the correct number of significant digits and be able to do the math correctly. All right, let's do adding and subtracting. Okay, adding and subtracting are not the same rules as multiplying division, dividing. That would make it too easy. Okay, Multi adding and subtracting, you can only go to the least accurate number. Does not matter how many divisions you have. Okay, let's add some numbers. Good example. Let's say we have 19.375 and we're adding 0. 2, 0. Okay. So we add those together, we get a 5, we get a 7, we get a 5, we get a 9, we get a 1. All right. The least accurate number is right, let me get a different color, is right here. Okay. That's as accurate as you get two places past the decimal. Okay. And that is a significant figure. Okay. So this number has to be 19.5, and this is exactly five. So it rounds that number here up, 19.58 would be your answer. Okay, it doesn't matter how many significant digits you have, the answer here has four significant digits. I mean, this has five and this has two significant digits, but your answer has four when you're adding and subtracting because you can only make the number to the least accurate number. So the number that has the least numbers in the decimal place is all you can go to. You can't make it any more accurate than that. So if I put on there, let's put on there a different set here. I would, I would do it something like this. Whoops. Okay. 36.253. Plus 18.7 minus 3.26. Okay, that'd be something like you see on an exam. Okay. So you get your trusty calculator out. Since everybody uses calculators nowadays, no one has things in their heads. We say 36.253 plus 18.7 minus 3.26. And we come out with, on the calculator, 51.693 as our answer. Again, if you put that answer on your exam, will you be wrong? Yes. yes. You bet. Okay. This number is accurate to three places past the decimal. This number is accurate to one place past the decimal. This number is accurate to two places past the decimal. So how many places past the decimal are you going to be accurate to? Which is the least number? One. 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 So you draw your line. I like to draw lines. You draw a line at one place past the decimal, and that's your number. Now, this number, is it going to round up or stay the same? Round up. Round up, round up because up. this number is greater than five, greater than or equal to five. So your answer becomes 51.7. Okay. Does that make sense now? Yes, Dr. Okay. So yeah, remember there's two different rules for multiplying, dividing, and for adding and subtracting. Okay. Multiplying, dividing, it's the least number of significant digits. Makes it simple. Adding and, adding and subtracting is the least accurate number. How many places past the decimal is the lowest number? Okay. So let's do, let's do one with uh, exponents just to see how people are doing here. And then we'll move on. So let's give you a math problem. Let's say 3.963 times 10 to the negative 2 times 86.937 divided by 6.022 times 10 to the negative 4 divided by 7.003 
times 10 to the fifth. Okay, that could be a typical question you'd see on your midterm. It just says do the math. Now you gotta remember, I'm not gonna tell you how many seven digits you can express your number. You've gotta figure that out, round it off, write your number in. Okay, and then exponent. The easiest way to do this is forget about these exponents till the end. This is what I would do. There's your exponent, there's your exponent, there's your exponent, and I'm gonna have any. So let's take out a trusty calculator and just do things in order. Let's take 3.963, where's my calculator? There it is, 3.963 times, so hit the times key, 86.937, 86.937, okay. Hit divide, you get 6.022 times, okay. Then hit divide again, 7.003 and hit equals. And you end up with a number, let's put it in blue here, 8.16969574. And it's gonna be times 10 to the something, I haven't figured that out yet, okay? So there's your calculator number. And when you multiply or divide exponents, you add them. When you bring this up, this becomes 10 to the fourth, you change the sign. Bring this up, it becomes 10 to the minus five, okay? So you've got minus two plus four is two, minus five is negative three. That's how you do exponents. Make it real easy. Save them for the end, you bring them up, change the sign, add them together. Minus two plus four is, is two, two minus five is negative three. So there's your exponent, okay? Now, when you're doing these problems, a lot of people, I, I guarantee you, third base on the class, you can get it wrong because they're going to do 3.963 times 86.963 divided by 6.022 times 7.033. That's not what it says. If the number is on the top, hit the multiply key. If the number is on the bottom, hit the division key. It's that simple. So you heard me say it's 3.963, hit the times key. 86.937, divide key, 6.022, divide key, 7.003. If it's on the top, you hit multiply. If it's on the bottom, you hit divide. That way you don't worry about parentheses or anything like that. It just makes it simple. The simpler you can keep it, the less mistakes you're going to make. I guarantee you. Um, and then do your- I have a question. Sure, go for it. So you're multiplying the top two, leaving out the exponents, and then divide, and then divide the bottom. Yeah, I leave out the exponents completely till the end. Okay, so we would multiply the top two numbers, and then hit the divide, and then divide the six point two by seven point zero. Those numbers. No, 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 no. Hit if if it's okay. Walk walk me through. We found your calculator. Exactly how you do it. You you enter three point nine six three. Start there. Okay, so you, you enter that and then multiply it by eight, it's six, times. nine, three. Yes, times. Okay. And then divide that by 6.022 times. No, seven no, no. Divide? Do, yes. If it's on the top, hit multiply, the bottom, hit divide. Okay. I guarantee you'll get it right. Just keep it simple. Now you can put parentheses and do your calculator differently and all that kind of stuff, but you don't have to do that. The simpler you keep it, the less mistakes you're gonna make on an exam. Cause you're gonna be nervous when you take an exam. Okay. You're not gonna remember parentheses and that. So the exact sequence you would do is circle your exponents like I just did and save them till the end. You would enter in your calculator, exactly as I say, 3.963 times 86.937, divide 6.022, divide 7.003 equals. And that gives you this number. Then you do your exponents. When you bring them up, you change the sign. Then you add them together. If you have negative two plus four minus five is negative three. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense, Kyla? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, because it's a lot of students, they're going to make that mistake. And like I said, the simplest you can keep things, the better you can do on your exams. Because you're going to get nervous, you're going to forget things, but if it's on the top, hit multiply. If it's on the bottom, hit divide. Okay. 
and then do your exponent. Now, is this the right answer? No, why not? Because it's not in significant form. Perfect. It doesn't have the correct number of significant figures. So let's look at this now. Let's go, let's go significant figures for each one. How many significant figures in our first number? 3.963. Eight. How many significant figures in 3.963? Four. Four. How many significant figures in 86.937? Five. 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 How many in 6.022? Four. Four. How many in 7.003? Four. 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 Okay, the lowest number is? Four. Four. So we go one, two, we go one, two, three, four. And we draw a line where we have to put four significant figures. Okay. Now, okay. is the number here greater than five or less than five? Greater than five. Greater than five. So now we round this nine up. We round nine up, nine becomes 10. So instead of 69, it rounds up to 70. So it's 8.170 times 10 to the negative three is your correct answer. This has four significant digits and it's rounded to the correct position. Okay. Remember, if you round the nine up, you have 10 here. So 69 rounds to 70. I know there's a lot thrown at you here. Okay, you wanna try another one like that? Does that make sense? I had a question about the, I'm sorry, the exponents. Sure. You said you you added, you said it was negative two plus four minus five, or was it right when you figured out? No, we save, every, save those to the end. So I have 10 to the negative two on top, right? See yeah. that right here? Okay, on the bottom, I have 10 to the minus four. So when I bring that up, I change the sign. So I have 10 to the fourth, bring everything up to the top. And then bring this one up. I change the sign, 10 to the minus five. And when we multiply exponents, we just add them together. So we take minus two plus four, then minus five. So minus two plus four is plus two, minus five is negative three. So that's where this okay. negative three comes from. Okay, thank you. So I clarify. No problem, Cassandra. Okay, makes sense? Yes. Okay, you guys want another one or move on here? Can we do another one? Sure, we can do another one. Not a problem. I can make problems up all night long. I love making up problems. Let me get this cleared off a little bit. Actually, I got more slides. You can just probably do that rather than erase all these. Okay, so let's make up uh, three... Point eight oh oh times ten to the negative three times eight point nine three times ten to the six divided by zero point zero seven nine eight. Divided by 5.6321 times 10 to the negative, oh, let's go eight. Okay, so there's our problem. So the first step is to take a deep breath and don't panic because it looks like math, but it's not, you know how to do this, okay? Just don't see math and panic because we can figure this out. You're gonna, you're gonna circle all your exponents. This is how I would do it. I always, whenever I do it exams, I have circles, lines, all things everywhere. Circle all your exponents. Okay, use different colored pencils if you like. It's easy that way. Okay. I'm gonna save those for last. Now it's easy. Now it's 3.800. So in your calculator, go to calculator on your, on your iPhone, hit clear, make sure 
it goes through and hit 3.800, okay? And then on top, you hit times 8.93, 8.93. That's the top. Then on the bottom, you hit divide 0 0.0798. And then you hit divide again, because it's still on the bottom, 5.6321. 5.6321. Okay, then you hit equals. And it comes out to 75.0798. Five eight two six. Okay, so everybody get that when they do it on their their iPhones on the calculators. So there's your number, and then we got to figure out the exponents. So look at our exponents. Let's bring everything to the top line. So for our exponents, we have ten to the minus three. I'll put those right in the corner here. 10 to the minus three, and then 10 to the six. Those are on top. We bring the 10 to the minus eight up. So that becomes 10 to the eight. Because you bring it up, you change the sign. Okay, and then we add those together. So minus three plus six is three. Eight plus three is 11. So it's 10 to the 11. So this becomes times 10 to the 11th. Okay. So far so good? Yeah. All right, now we look at significant figures. We can't have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine significant figures in our answer. So we look at our numbers. The first number, 3.800, has how many significant figures? Four. Four. 8.93 is how many significant figures? Three. Three. 0.0798 has how many? Three. Three. Perfect. 5.6321 has how many? Five. Five. You guys got this. The lowest number is? Three. Three. So we got to have three, so we count three digits and we draw our line. So it becomes. We look at this number here. It's less than five or greater than five. It's less than five, so the number stays the same. So it becomes 75.5 times 10 to the 11. Now, that's an acceptable answer. If the question asks for scientific notation, is that number in scientific notation? No. No. Remember, scientific notation has to be between one and 10. That's 75, that's definitely not between one and 10. So we gotta move that decimal point to where this number is between nine and 10. I mean, one and 10. So it becomes 7.55 times 10 to the, and I made that, I went from 75 to 7.5. I made that number smaller, so I have to make the exponent bigger because you gotta do the opposite to keep the number the same. As you move the decimal point to make it smaller, you gotta move the other way on the exponent. So if I made it smaller by one, I made the exponent bigger by one. So the answer in the notation for that problem is 7.55 times 10 to the 12. Write that down, make oh. sure you can duplicate that. Yes. If you made the if you made it smaller by two, would you have to add two to the exponent? Yes. Okay. And I move the decimal point two places to make it smaller, I'd add two. If I move the decimal place two places to make it bigger, I'd subtract two. The amount you move that decimal point is the amount you change. If you make the number smaller, you make the exponent bigger. If you make the number larger, you make the exponent smaller to keep the same value for your number. Because you're only moving decimal points. You're not changing the number at all. All right, significant digits, uh, conversions. Okay, questions. Everybody seem to understand it? 
Is there somewhere I can find the topics you're picking, Doctor? Yeah, I'm just reading. I'm, I'm just going right through the book. I'm just reading right through your book. Just picking out some important topics I'm going through. Yep, I'm following right along the order of the textbook. Is this part of chapter two? This is chapter two point, where are we at? Two point, 2.1. Then unit conversions are 2.2. Okay, thank you. Hey, no problem. All right, we good with those? All right, let's do some, I'll, let's go over, well, let's go over some conversions. We convert cubes, uh, square feet, and let's convert different things. So let's start with a simple conversion, then it'll get more difficult on you to make sure we can do it. Then we've got density and temperature, okay. All right, and like I said, it, I'm here for you guys. I'm just here to answer questions, and I'll go through these topics as we go along. I want to do it nice and slow so you understand the topics that you need. If you, if you don't have questions, I'll just do some reviews of things I think are important, which translates to what you're going to see on your midterm. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Let's do a convert. Let's convert. Uh, let's see. Somebody weighs in at... Let's do a very simple one at first to start off. Let's do, say we have a person, say I have a patient, says most of your nursing students, patient comes in and weighs 198.7 pounds. Okay. How much is that in kilograms? Because everything's in kilograms. Well, actually, let's, let's go to grams. Let's go all the way to grams because everything's in the metric scale when you're doing patient records now. So 198, you still, like I said, you're starting with that number. So write it down, 198.7 pounds times, and you put pounds on the bottom to cancel. Now you just look at your conversion charts and you'll see in there a conversion between pounds to kilograms. And we know there's 2.205 pounds in one kilogram. Now we got kilograms. Kilograms go on the bottom. And I want to go to, let me go to grams. Instead of writing K, what is K equal to the metric system? K is kilo. Kilo is a thousand. So 10 to the third is K. I do everything with, I mean, you can write out a thousand too, be just as right. I mean, a lot of people write a, a thousand grams per kilogram. It's the same thing. I just use metrics because that's how I learned it and that's how I, re I remember things. Okay, but you can, there's multiple ways of doing this. You can do different conversion numbers too. This is one way of doing it. But if you do them right, you'll always get the same answer. So make sure each of these is equal to one. One kilogram is 2.205 pounds. One kilogram. One kilo is a thousand grams. So those, those, both of those equal one. You see what I'm saying when I say equals one? It's the same number on top and the same number on the bottom. One kilogram is the exact same thing as 10 to the third grams. One kilogram is the same thing as 2.205 pounds. So you're multiplying by one. You're not changing the number. You're changing the units. So all you do is multiply by one and you're changing your units. So pounds cancel, kilograms cancel, you're left with grams, which is what we want. So we take, we take our little trusty calculators and we say 198.7, sorry, 198.7 divided by 2.205, and I'll say my exponents to last, equals, comes out to 90.11, three, three, seven, eight, seven. Okay. And then I only have one exponent here on the top. So that's times 10 to the third. 
Now, how many significant digits do we have? Okay. These are conversion numbers. These are exact numbers. They do not get involved in significant figures. So we look at our number. Our measured value is four significant digits. So I can have four significant digits in my number. Okay. I look at the number to the right of the line. It's less than five. The number stays the same. So your answer becomes 90 point one one times 10 to the three kilograms. A uh, grams, I'm sorry. Ah, they said or I wrote it wrong. 10 to three grams. Okay. That's not in sign notation. I don't want to put in sign notation. If now that's just, that's a perfect answer right there. But if the question asks to put it in scientific notation, then you have to change it. So scientific notation, it becomes, let me get another color here, nine, because you have to put them between not one and 10. So 9.011 times 10 to the, and I move the decimal from there to there. Okay, I moved it one place to the left. In the second. Perfect, I made, I made that, what's that? Would it be 10 to the second power? No. Other way. Oh, uh, fourth. Perfect. Perfect. We see why. Because 90, I made this, now I made this nine. I made this number smaller. Okay. I went from 90 to nine. I made it smaller. So I have to make this number, the exponent, bigger to keep it the same. So if I moved it, I made it by, I made it one smaller. I can make this one one bigger, 10 to the fourth. So if I'm making something smaller, I move it this one place smaller, I make it one place bigger on the exponent. Does that make sense, Taylor? Ta ta is it Talia? Yes. Talia, yes, it makes Talia. sense. Talia, okay. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Okay. That's a relatively simple conversion. Now we can convert other things, not quite so simple. Let's do, let's say they want to, sell you a car to use car lot. I like muscle cars. I like fast motorcycles. I ride motorcycles every day of my life. That's what I drive. So say they want to sell this motorcycle and they tell you it goes at, it'll go, let's say 12.5 inches. That's a five per in quarter of a second. 0 0.25 seconds. Okay. Do you buy it? Is that fast? It's going 12.5 inches in, in a quarter of a second, 2.5 seconds, 0.25 seconds. Okay. Let's convert it. Let's convert it into something we know. We know miles per hour, right? So let's start with the top. I want to convert inches into miles. So I know. Um, I know there's, like say there's 12 inches in a foot. So 12 inches converts to one foot. Okay. I know there's 5,200 feet in a mile. Now there's other conversions you can use. I could have gone from metric, I could have gone, I could have started a whole bunch of things. But whatever you want, you just use what you, what you know, what you look at on your, your tables. So 5,280 feet per mile. Okay, now I got miles on the top, which is what I want. My inches canceled, my feet canceled, I'm left with miles. So I have miles per second. I still don't want miles per second. I want miles per what? I want miles per hour. So I can convert the bottom number to hours. So seconds are on top. I know there's 60 seconds in a minute. I know there's 60 minutes in an hour. Seconds cancel, minutes cancel, I'm left with miles per hour. And that's what I want. And that's our conversion. That's all it is. You make sure every one of these conversion units that you did is equal to one. One foot is 12 inches. One mile is 5,200 feet. 60 seconds is one minute. 60 minutes is one hour. Now, doing the math. Remember I told you to keep it simple. Okay, don't make this into a math class. 
class. This is chemistry. And there is some math in it, but let's keep the math extremely simple. Remember what, what I tell you about numbers on the top and numbers on the bottom. What's the rule? If it's on the top, you what? Multiply. If it's on the bottom, you do what? Divide. Divide. That's it. So take your trusty calculator. This is how you're going to enter the number. You're going to hit 12.5, divide 0.25. And then the 12 on the bottom. So you divide again. You can hit 12. And the 5 on the bottom, you hit divide 5280. Okay. 60 is on top. So you hit times 60 times 60. If the number is on the bottom, you hit divide. If it's on the top, you hit multiply. It's that simple. Then hit equals. And it comes out to 2.84 miles per hour. Are you going to buy that motorcycle? <laughs> I can walk faster than that. And I can't walk fast. Okay. Considering the new Suzuki coming out, the high boost is going to go over 200 miles an hour. That's not a very fast motorcycle. Okay, so 12.5 inches and in quarter of a second comes out to 2.84 miles per hour. And that's a, that's a conversion problem. Keep the math simple. I'm not going to get into any complicated math, I promise you. I, I don't want this to be a math class. You have to be able to do some math, I understand it. But what, what I've showed you so far is if you remember my rules, you will, I guarantee you'll keep it simple. Now you can watch YouTube videos where they put parentheses around things and they make numbers come here and there and keep it simple for yourselves. The simpler you keep it, the better you're going to do on your exams. And the more you're going to be able to apply this to your nursing profession. Okay. When we're doing, we're, but when I'm doing, when we're doing this chemistry, if you have any medical questions with it, ask me. Okay. I've been doing forensic dentistry for, with, uh, for 15, 16 years now. So I got a lot of medical training with autopsies and with how they determine bullet speeds and everything else. Okay. I've been I've done that in a lot of the, the bodies out here in the desert. Okay. We knew a lot of the diseases that affect different people. So if you have questions, always feel free to ask me, even if they're not related to the class. Like I said, I, I do dentistry and I've done a lot of medical forensics for a long time now. All right, so the answer to this question is no, you do not buy this motorcycle. That's what you put in your exam. 2.84 miles per hour is not going to be a muscle car or a high-speed motorcycle. Does that make sense? Yes, so thank you. Cool. Questions? Want to do another, another one and move on? Actually, let's do an area one. Let's say um, you got to search a field. Say you're looking for a body. And you got to search a cornfield. Cornfield is, say it's 762 centimeters by 892 inches. Okay. That's the size of this cornfield. So what is the area you have to have in, let's say you have to put it into an international report that we had to put in the medical system. Say it has to be in how many meters squared are you going to have to search for this body? Okay. Like I said, keep the math simple. Convert. Okay. You know the area is the length times the width. So you got to multiply those two numbers together. Can you multiply centimeters and inches? No. No. You got to have the same units. You can't multiply apples and oranges. Okay, you got to make sure they're the same units. So let's convert everything into the same units. And since we want meters squared for a report, let's just convert both to meters. Okay? Like I said, make it simple on yourselves. There's all kinds of formulas you can use to do this, but make it simple. So 762 centimeters, let's convert that to meters. So centimeters go on the bottom, 
and then meters here. Look at the letter C. Look at your data packet or look at your chart. If you look at C on the metrics chart, it says 10 to the minus 2. That's a centimeter. Centi means 10 to the minus 2. Okay. So 10 to the minus 2 means you're going to move the decimal point two places to the left. Okay. So it's going to come out to 7.62 meters. Okay. The exponent is just moving decimal places. And it says negative 2. So move this decimal point two places to the left because it's negative. Negative means you to make it smaller. So you have 7.62 meters for that size. Now, let's go to the other one. We go inches. I know there's 2.54 centimeters in an inch. That's another on the data packet. You can look that up. These are just ones I just happen to know because you do it so often you just remember them. 2.54 centimeters per inch. And like I said, you don't have to memorize. I don't like in my classes, I don't like memorization. I guarantee you when you graduate and you go get a job, whether it's a nursing profession or PA or whatever you want to do, engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, whatever you want to do, no one is going to pay you. They're not going to hand you a book and say, here, memorize this and pay you money. Nobody pays you to memorize something. They pay you to think and to analyze and to make them money. Okay. No one's going to pay you to memorize something. They're not going to give you something to go, go memorize this. Okay. It doesn't happen. So learn how to think. Don't worry about memorizing it. Know how to look it up. Know where the numbers are. That's all you got to know. So now we've gone from inches to centimeters. And then centimeters, you can go back to meters the exact same way. C is 10 to the minus 2. So get out your famous calculators and put in 892. 892. times 2.54 equals, so this is going to equal 2,265.68, okay, times 10 to the negative 2, okay, so we're going to take our decimal point and move it two places to the left, so we're going to end up with 22 point six five six eight and we have how many significant digits six there, there's six in this number but how many can we have in our answer how many are we allowed three three because this is a measurement here that has three three digits so here's a line so what is our answer going to be? Is the, the number to the, excuse me, number to the right greater than five, or less than five? Greater than five. Greater than five. So this rounds up to a seven. So you have 22.7 meters. So our cornfield that we have to search is 7.62 meters wide by 22.7 meters long. To find the area, we multiply them together. We multiply those numbers together. So we have 7.62 meters, always put your units, times 22.7 meters. Okay, so 7.62 times 22.7, 7.62 times 22 points. Ah, hit the wrong number. 22.7. Ah, hit the wrong number again. Okay, 22. Point seven, got it. 172.974. And then units are meters times meters, so meters squared. Remember, length is a meter, an area is meters squared, a volume is meters cubed. Volumes are cubed, areas are squared, linear measurements are, are just meters singular. A linear measurement is just a single unit. You square it, you're multiplying two numbers, length times width. You got a volume measuring, you're multiplying three numbers, length times width times height. All right, so 172.97, is this your answer? Is this how you'd leave it? If you did, you'd get it wrong. 
What do you have to do? Scientific notation. That's not, what's that? Change it to scientific notation. You could do that. But what do you do first before scientific notation? How many significant figures does your answer have? Six. Six. How many does the numbers have that you're multiplying? Three. Three. You cannot make a number more accurate by using math to manipulate it. So you have to round your answer off to how many significant figures? Three. Three. Perfect. So count three figures, draw your line. Is this number greater than five or less than five? Greater. Greater than five. So it rounds up. So we end up with, where can I write this? 173 square meters. So in your report to Interpol, because it's international, you got to use metric system. You say the corner you have to search for the body is 173 square meters. And that's conversions. Questions on conversions? Does that make sense? If anybody wants more examples, tell me I'll do more examples. If not, we can go on to density. Can we do one more example? Sure. I'll be glad to do one more example. No problem. Let's do a let's do a volume one. Let's put a volume. Let's say we have a cube. Is that a cube? It's kind of a box. I'm never good at drawing cubes. Yeah, I can't do that one. Let's do a cube. How do I draw a cube? It's, I'm not good at drawing three dimensions here. Like I said, my, my son's the artist. How's that? Is that a cube? Close enough. That's about as close as I'm going to get. <laughs> Let me someone make it great here. All right. Let's have three. Cubes have three sides. Let's say this side is six point two inches. Let's say this side is twelve centimeters. And let's say this is, let's see that side, that side, then going across would be this one here. Uh, 0 0.093 meters, meters, feet, meters. Okay. Nope, there's three units and you want to know the volume of this cube. You want to know the volume of the cube in, oh, uh, let's say cubic centimeters. Because there's a magic number with cubic centimeters in doing math conversions. That one mil, because you can take a measurement of length and turn it into a volume of liquid by knowing the fact that one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. Again, that's in your data table too. And we use that as a neat, that's a really neat conversion to have. Then you can measure something, put it into millers, how much water is going to displace. All right, so, I know but not everybody gets excited about chemistry as I do, but that's okay. I like teaching this stuff. I have fun. Um, so we needed it to be in centimeters. So 12 cubic centimeters, we're good, right? It's in centimeters. Let's convert everything else to centimeters. So let's convert 6.2 inches into centimeters. And we know one of our conversions is 2.54 centimeters per inch. So 6.2 times 2.54, 6.2 times 2.54, ah, come on, 2.54 equals 15. 
and that's only good to two significant digits. So what does that round off to? Sixteen. Sixteen. Rounds off to sixteen. You're good to two significant digits. What's that? Was there a question? No. Okay. So sixteen cubic centimeters. This is twelve cubic centimeters, and now we've got zero point zero nine three meters. And I want to turn that into centimeters. So meters on the bottom, centimeters on top. Instead of writing C, I write 10 to the minus two. I make sure that equals to one. Okay, so meters cancel, I'm left with centimeters. So 0 0.093, and then when I move this up, we change the sign, right? So it becomes 10 to the two. So I move that decimal point two places, it becomes 9.3 centimeters. And that's already two significant digits, so we're good. So now I got all three numbers in centimeters. So now they're all the same. So I want the volume, volume means width times length times height. So all three numbers have to be multiplied. So we're gonna multiply 12 centimeters by 16 centimeters by 9.3 centimeters. And that comes out to, da, 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 where's my calculator? 12 times 16 times 9.3. One, seven, 85, Point six. Okay, and what are our units going to be? Centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. Centimeters, centimeters to the third power, centimeters cubed. Remember, areas will always be squared. Volume will always be cubed. Okay, now that can't be your answer because you have too many significant digits. You have to make it two significant digits. So how do we do that? That burn came on. That's another. Okay. One way to do it is put in science notation. You put in sign to notation, it becomes 1.7856 times, oh man, what did I do? Times 10, and I move this decimal one, two, three places to the left. So I made it, I made it smaller by three decimal points. I have to make it bigger by three decimal points. So there's our answer in sign of notation. Now it's easy to round off the two. I make my line. What does that become? One point what? Two. I'm sorry, one point eight. <laughs> Where'd you get two from? <laughs> one point eight times 10 to the three cubic centimeters. So when you're running into trouble with rounding digits off, and because you've got a bigger number, put it inside notation, and it makes it simple because it puts everything between one and 10. It makes it really simple to, you won't make mistakes that way. And that's your answer. 1.8 times 10 to the three cubic centimeters. Okay, so we've done conversions. Like I said, the conversions are probably one of the hardest things to do in chemistry because everybody looks at it as math and they just immediately say it's going to be hard. But do it step by step. If you want more problems, email me. I'll send you a bunch more problems. I can make up problems between patients all day long.
I'll go between patients, I'll read emails, I'll make a math, and I'll work with you over emails all the time. We can do extra Zoom meetings if you want. I do not mind at all. We can meet in person if you want. We can meet at the library. We can meet at, if someone wants to get, if one great way to learn chemistry is study groups. Study groups are phenomenal. All the COVID stuff starting to go away here and everything's going back face to face. So if you want to meet at someone's house, I'd be glad to come over. Or you can meet at my house, we can come over and do a chemistry study session. You want to get enough people together. Jesus. So if you have problems with something, I really want to help together. you do it and overcome it. I don't want you to suffer through any of it. If you have problems, email me. I'm up at weird hours of the night. So send me an email. As soon as I read it, I will get back to you with the information. I usually am pretty good responding really quick. Okay? So I don't want you to hung up on things. I want you to learn chemistry, not struggle with math. That's my idea of the class. All right, let's go to density. Density. Density is, by definition, density is equal to your mass divided by your volume. That's density. Okay, that's all it is, how dense something is. Okay. Something more dense will penetrate something less dense. Okay. That's why bulletproof vests stop a bullet. The bulletproof vest is denser than the bullet. That's why you have armor piercing rounds with, with military. They use uranium, which is extremely dense, depleted uranium in making the bullet. That way the bullet's more dense than the armor than the body armor or the tank, the bullet will power penetrate. Okay, so whatever it's, it, density depends on how it's going to react. So if you've got, um, let's think of a good example here. If you have a, let's take a bullet from a crime scene. You have a bullet from your crime scene. Take a bullet from. Okay. Uh, one way we do this to determine density of the bullet to determine what material is because different materials are different densities like lead or zinc or copper with the bullets made out of, okay? You put the bullet on a scale and it's weighs say 45.37 grams, okay? And then we take a graduated cylinder. A graduated cylinder is a measured tube which has increments of five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, up to if it's a 50 millimeter graduated cylinder, goes to 50, 100 goes up to 100. Say we take a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder and we put in 30 milliliters of water. Okay, remember you measure at the meniscus. And so say there's 30 milliliters of water in this graduated cylinder here. We take this bullet and we drop it in. Okay, we drop it in. The volume goes from 30 to 38.6 milliliters. Okay, because you put something in water, the water rises, right? If you fill your bathtub directly level, you put your kid in it, what's going to the water? It's going to overflow, right? When you put something in water, it displaces the volume of what you're putting it in. If it's a baby, it displaces the volume of the baby. The bigger the baby, the more water squashed out of the bathtub. Okay? So the bullet displaces or moves the water up 38.6 milliliters. So it's moved the water how far? 38.6 is what it's at now. It was at 30. Point zero, let's put 30.0, keep our numbers right. Okay, so it comes out to 8.6 milliliters of water was raised up. So the volume is 8.6 milliliters. The mass is 45.37. So there's simple ways of determining mass and volume in a lab. Very simple to do. Remember to do, or you can measure out the height, the width, the length, and try to estimate to save the bullet that's been deformed when it hit the body. Or all kinds of easiest way, drop in water. That's it. Every with me so far. Because you'll see a question like this on your midterm. I just got done writing your midterm. Okay. So the density of the bullet, what's the density of the bullet? The density of the bullet is your mass, which is 45.37 divided by your volume, which is 8.6 milliliters. So 45.37, 37 divided by 8.6 equals 5.2755814. Okay, on the calculator. 
on the floor. Okay. So far, so good. Now, what are the units? The units are grams per milliliter. That's units of density. Okay. How many significant digits can the answer have? Two. Two, perfect. Even though we're measured, we measured three units here, three units and four units here, we did the math, we only have one place past the decimal here. So this gives this answer only two significant digits. Though there's two significant digits here, so your answer can only have two significant digits. So what is your answer? Five point what? Five point three. Five point three, that's greater than five. Five point three grams per milliliter. That is the density of the bullet down at the crime scene. And like I said, different metals have different densities. So you determine what metal the bullet was made from, what manufacturer came from, and so on like that, depending on the density of it. All right. And the same, you can, you can use simple math to manipulate a formula also. So we had density equals mass over volume. If you were given the mass and the density, you can find the volume. Volume is equal to mass divided by density. Just algebraically move it around. Mass is equal to density times volume. Okay. Use algebra to move it around. You multiply V to both sides, you have a V over here. Divide by D on both sides, and you get that. Okay. Times V to one both sides, you get this. Because they'll cancel. So you can use your formulas in different ways. So whatever I give you, if I give you two out of the three, you can find the other variable. If I give you mass and volume, you can find the density formula. If I give you the mass and the density, you can find the volume. If I give you the, the density and the volume, you can find the mass. Like I said, keep things simple. Okay, any questions on that? Could you do one more example? Sure, let's do an example where we have to find Let's say that you have a block. Again, I'm not good at drawing three-dimensional things. I should have my son drawing a whole bunch of pictures. Say we have a block of iron. This iron has a density, you look it up as 1.5879 grams per milliliter. That's the density of iron. Okay, say we put this on a scale and we weigh it out and this block has a mass of 39.86 grams, okay? So far so good? If we have a graduated cylinder And we fill the graduated cylinder with 20 milliliters of water, 20.00 milliliters of water. Okay. If I take that block and dump it into the cylinder, how high will the water rise? Perfect question. Okay. How much will this water increase once I drop the block in? You know it's going to increase, right? You're dropping something into water, it has a volume, it's going to make it go up. So we have to figure the volume of the block. We know density equals mass divided by volume. So we're looking for volume. So volume equals mass divided by density. We know the mass. It's 39.86 grams. We know the density. The density is 
5.879 grams per milliliter. Okay, we look at our numbers, grams on top, grams on bottom. Remember, you divide by divide, it goes up. So it becomes milliliters. So we take 39.86 divided by 1.5879. So 39.86, 39.86 divided by 1.5879. Equals 25, holy cow, 25.10233, 1023364. Okay, that's the number you get. So that gives you milliliters. Okay, so we, we round that off, right? So what is our answer going to be? How many, significant, how many significant figures can the answer have? Four. Four. Okay. That is our measured value, too. This is four. This was a looked up value. This was a, um, a standard value. We looked that up on the, on the text. But still, there's five significant digits there anyway. So four significant digits. So we count our digits. One, two, three, four, and put our line. I love drawing lines. Okay. So 25. 0.10 milliliters. That's our volume, right? So what's the new what's the new level going to be on the graduate cylinder? We have 20 milliliters of water right here. We dump in this block. This block is going to raise it, displace 25.10 milliliters. So we started with 20.00. We're going to add 25.10 milliliters. That's in milliliters. So we're going to, it's going to raise up to 45.10 milliliters. That's what the new level is going to be on your graduated cylinder. It's going to come up that much. It's going to increase it by 25.10 milliliters. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So I get all kinds of creative questions and stuff like that. As long as you understand the concepts, we're good. And I really got one more thing. And I'll finish chapter two. Wow. You guys are sharp. That's pretty quick. Okay. Any more, any more questions on density? Oh. All no. right, let's, okay, cool. Let's do temperature. Like I said, I'm, I'm here for you guys. I'm really here to answer questions. And there's no set. I mean, I don't mind any questions at all. It doesn't have anything to do with chemistry. If, if you're asking me questions, it means you're listening to me. And that's, that's all I can ask for, you know? So never be afraid to ask a question. I'll never make fun of a question. And there are no foolish questions, okay? Always, always ask. It's not, it's not worth sitting there struggling for hours and hours what I can do is ask me, we can figure it out. Okay, so temperature. There's three temperature measures we're going to deal with. We're going to deal with degrees centigrade, degrees Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. Everybody has pet peeves, right? My pet peeve is, well, there's two, I have two pet peeves. People that say uh, the, the TMJ joint for your your mouth, they come in and say, I have TMJ. I, everybody has a TMJ. TMJ means temperature. you have TMJ dysfunction, or you have TMJ problems, or your jaw kinses or pops or clicks. You can't come in and say, I have TMJ. It's like saying, I have arm, I have leg. Yes, I mean, your TMJ is there. Okay, that's one pet peeve. The other one is right here. In Kelvin, there is no such thing, and you will be marked wrong on exam if you put degrees Kelvin. Kelvin is not a degree. Kelvin's a measurement of energy. You have degree centigrade, degree Fahrenheit. Those are temperatures. Kelvin's a measurement of energy, a measurement of movement. Now you can convert degree centigrade and degrees Fahrenheit into Kelvin. Okay? But you can never have degrees Kelvin. Kelvin is not a temperature. Kelvin is energy. Kelvin is movement. Because at zero Kelvin, all movement stops and life as you know it ends. 
Think, think of a new, think of an atom that makes up your whole body. You got a nucleus, you got electrons flying around it, positive and negative charge being held together. The only keeping that, the only thing keeping those electrons away from the nucleus is motion. If those electrons stop moving, atoms becomes, you condense the earth into the size of a pinpoint. Because all the atoms condense. No, at zero Kelvin, everything ceases to exist. Now, black holes are really close to zero Kelvin. That's why everything is condensed in it. There's no mass. Everything is combined into mass. Uh, let me hang that up. Yeah. Wait a minute, I lost something here. Someone's trying to call me, but we'll get later. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah, where my where my slides go? Boy, all my slides disappeared. That's funny. That's okay. We can fix it. We're doing degrees centigrade, degrees Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. Remember, Kelvin is no degrees. Kelvin is movement. Zero Kelvin, all movement stops. All right, so centigrade. Centigrade is the time to measure that we use. We can convert between centigrade and Fahrenheit using the formula degrees Fahrenheit is equal to nine-fifths your degree centigrade plus 32. Okay, so if you know degree centigrade, you can find Fahrenheit. Now we can move that around. Okay, why am I getting messages popping up here? Okay. Okay, so now if we want, if we have, if we're given degrees centigrade, we can find degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. If we're given degrees Fahrenheit, we can find degrees centigrade by moving this around. We take degrees Fahrenheit, subtract 32 from both sides, and then five ninths equals degrees centigrade. Just by moving that formula around. Just mathematical manipulation. So now if we're given Fahrenheit, we can find degrees centigrade. Okay, and Kelvin we can find Kelvin's equal to our degree centigrade plus 273.15. Okay. So at zero degree centigrade, that's freezing point of water. So at zero degree centigrade, that's 273.15 Kelvin. So it's gonna take a lot to get Kelvin to approach zero. So Kelvin's our measurement of movement. So we can calculate any temperature. So let's do an example. Let's say if I give you, let's do another slide. If I say your patient, your patient's running a fever of 104.3 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that in centigrade? Okay, because you want to convert that into centigrade. So I'm given Fahrenheit, so I know centigrade. I know our formula. And again, you'll have these in your book. You look these up during your exam. You don't, do not have to memorize formulas. Just know where to find them. And they're they're in the data packet too. That I give you. So five ninths degrees Fahrenheit minus thirty two. Is that what it was? Yeah, minus thirty two. Okay. So degrees centigrade is equal to five ninths one hundred and four point three. Ah, that's not right. 104, gosh, I'm having a hard, having a hard time drawing here. 104.3 degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 times five divided by nine. Okay, so now you have parentheses. In math, with parentheses, you do the parentheses first. So you take your number. You take 104.3, 104.3 minus 32 equals. Now, a tip on your calculator here. If you put 104.3 minus 32 times 5 divided by 9, you'll get the wrong answer. Because your calculator works on mathematical... Um, logistics of how it orders it. It'll do the multiplication first before the, the, the adding and subtracting. 
the order of operations is how your calculator works. So what you have to do in, in situations like this, you have to do the parentheses first, which means you hit 104.3 minus 32, then hit equals. That gives you your numbers. If you don't hit equals first, it's going to do the multiplication division first, then go back and subtract. That's how calculator works on order of operations. Okay. So hit 104.3 minus 32 equals, and then hit times five divided by nine. Gives you 40.16666666667. Okay. So we had, we're doing, you're, you're doing subtraction, you're doing multiplication. So I'd say let's go one significant digit past the decimal point here. So we're good to 40.2 degrees centigrade. Okay. So 104.3 degrees Fahrenheit equals 40.2 degrees centigrade. Make sense? Now, Kelvin, if you wanted Kelvin, Kelvin's equal to 273.15 plus our degree centigrade, 40.2. So Kelvin equals 273 plus 40.2. I'll do it on the calculus, make sure I don't get it wrong here for you guys. 273.15 plus 40.2 comes out to 313. Point, and it's 0.35, so it rounds up to 4 Kelvin. That allows you to convert centigrade and Kelvin. Okay. And again, it's not degree Kelvin. Do not ever put a degree Kelvin. Put degree Fahrenheit, put degree centigrade. Kelvin is not temperature. Kelvin is movement, is energy. The scientific measurement for it. So now you can convert anything from Fahrenheit to centigrade to Kelvin. 